Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. And here I am coming at you from this corner of Costa Rica that I am in right now. And it's actually really nice when the volcano and the hills behind me don't um, have any uh, clouds hanging over them. And it's not doing an impression of Scotland. It's nice when the skies go clear. And this is one of those rare occasions where it's like that. So... Um, I have to do another twirl when all the sort of like foreground trees are out of the way so you can get another better look at them, right? So it is as I speak October the 12th, 2021, and um, oh, here we go. This is a better view of the volcano. There you go. Right, so yes, October the 12th, 2021, and um, I'm going for a bit of a walk uh, in an area that I would like actually to be quieter than it is, but then a million cars will start going by and a million dogs will start barking all at once. So we've got to get the quiet bits when they're here and uh, Bob's your uncle. So what I would like to talk about today is um, the, the new paradigm. Yes, the new paradigm for standalone people, right? Because this is what I'm thinking of at the moment, right? I spoke a lot, I thought a lot, back in the day, about a concept of a new paradigm when I was being all new age spiritual man in the 1990s and the noughties, right? And I can laugh mockingly at myself for being part of that back then. But the one thing that really did stick out for me was the idea that we would go into some sort of new reality paradigm that would be different and probably even discontinuous with the last one. The only thing is, of course, I expected it to be positive. Um, so far, it is not turning out to be positive at the all. What's happening is that most people can't assimilate it. And um, as I've spoken in the past uh, episodes about Ken Wilber's um, colour-coded um, thing that he spoke about, where, you know, there's the, the green and the orange, which both kind of represent the um, sort of individualistic, capitalist and collectivist, socialist ways of uh, that, that, that the world would be in the later part of the 20th century into the early part of the 21st century. He was talking about the yellow, and then the yellow is discontinuous with all of the previous colour codes. There's a new paradigm, which is basically an all-seeing, understanding all perspectives paradigm, which comes after the ones that we're in at the moment. And I think we're in it. I think the whole of reality is switched over into that. But the problem is most people can't deal with it. Most people have gone into a very, very strange state of shock and are desperately holding on to legacy systems because they don't, you know, how can I say, they don't comprehend the idea that this new reality paradigm that we're in is completely different. And of course, there is, yet, there is literature yet to be based on this. There is philosophy yet to be written on this. And um, we can only hope that there are a few pioneers that exist at the moment who could talk about this. I kind of think that, you know, although Jordan Peterson has been kind of uh, a very important person in all of this, in all the things that he himself has spoken about, right? Um, he talks about how them human beings cannot um, live, that cultures cannot perform if we try to be God ourselves in the way that Nietzsche spoke about, you know? that we need to have some kind of religion or we need to have some kind of thing that acts as a greater power. We have to have something to tell us that there's a reason to act as if God exists, right? And that we can't do this for ourselves. And he reckons that this is the part of the philosophy, if you like, that Friedrich Nietzsche got entirely wrong and didn't think through and died before he had a chance to um, reevaluate it or reflect on it. And um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know at all. I wouldn't claim to challenge Jordan Peterson on this because when it comes to, um, you know, getting deep, deep dives into philosophical literature, he'd be well ahead of me on that. But I still nevertheless would like to have a thought experiment going on, right? That if we are in the time that we are in at the moment, we have lost all our grand narratives. This is the, the situation we find ourselves in, Right? The grand narratives that kind of kept our society together are all going, or if they're not all gone, they are in the process of going, right? And um, we are living in these diffuse micro-worlds, right? We've gone from a broadcast world to a narrowcast world. And the narrowcast world basically means that everyone is living in all these different, um, these different echo chambers. And they're not, no people are no longer 
um, having different opinions. These days, people are even having different facts, which is the one thing that um, Douglas Murray mentioned, you know, that this is what makes life very, very strange and very difficult for us. And according to the Adam Kirk model, the hyper-normalization model, we are all living in um, different echo chambers. And so as a result of that, we can think that what we think is absolutely true and that people who disagree with us are sheeple or misguided or unintelligent or uninformed or conditioned or brainwashed or have, um, are deferring to a higher authority than themselves that they shouldn't be deferring to. But who's right? And my concern is that I don't think anyone actually knows who's right in this. Now, of course, recently what happened was that I, um, I did uh, send a message to Neil Kramer and he emailed me back, so that was nice. Me and Neil Kramer are cool. Excuse me, I'm out of breath going uphill. <laughs> right, so where was I? So I was happy about that. So then I decided to listen to one of his, uh, what was he called, Romecasts. Incidentally, he got that name from me. You know, he even confirms it in one of his Romecasts. So there you go, right? So, yeah, back in the day, I had Neil Kramer on my original um, podcast a few times. But these days, he doesn't like to spend much time on social media. And I kind of don't blame him, you know. When he's not doing his teaching, as it were, he's, uh, which he likes to do one-to-one with people, he likes to spend his time off social media with the people that he knows in his locale. And I mean, that's fair enough. But at the same time, right, um, one of the things that I decided I would do is listen to his Romecast anyway just to see where he's at and what his opinions on things are. And, well, I found that I was in disagreement with a few things that he was saying. But I also thought that, you know, the one thing that, um, that you know, I would want to do, and the one thing I'm sure that he would want to do as well, right, is to stand outside the, the kind of consensus reality paradigm that we find ourselves in, right, and think, well, it should be okay to have different opinions from each other, and it should be okay to disagree. There's no reason to be offended, and there's no reason um, to, uh, to hate each other or, or, or be balkanised off against each other over having different opinions on things. Now, of course, um, how do we come to those opinions? Did I come to my opposing opinions to him on certain things through my own individual discernment? If I did, then by his rules, he'd be all right with that, and um, vice versa, you see? So that's the thing. And I kind of think that that's um, the sort of, that's what we should be doing. We should be saying that this was the good things about the world as we knew it, right? That one of the good things about the way the world was and the world that we grew up in, in the world of freedom and so-called freedom and so-called democracy, at least freedom of speech and all of this stuff, right? One of the good things about that world was that we could have different opinions from each other and it was okay to have different opinions um, from each other. And that's, that was what you would call the epitome of the free world that we knew, was that it was perfectly okay for us to have different opinions from each other. Am I getting sweaty again? It's so fucking humid here, I can't stop sweating. Anyway, where was I? Yeah, so if that's one thing, then I think that's, that's the most important thing that I can possibly think of at the moment, that we have to be able to have different opinions from each other and we shouldn't fall out over it, right? Whether it be about... Co- uh, I'm going to say, I'm not going to mention the word now, whether it be about the word that you have left over when you take Linda away from Colin and David, which I will refer to in this video from now on as the Lurgy, right? Or whether it be about um, anything, right? We should all be able to have different opinions without us jumping down each other's throats, being offended by each other, any of that stuff. This is the problem. Um, It's what Terence McKenna referred to as balkanisation of epistemology. And... um, not many people um, actually would call it that, um, but not many people would actually know what that meant. But I think Terence McKenna's words, balkanisation of epistemology, sums up this problem. When balkanisation of epistemology turns into a form of, like, fiefdom warfare, which is kind of like what I think is happening at the moment in our world, then that's a real problem, right? So I would say to people that in this time we have to be able to accept that we see the world differently because that's the subjective layer of this reality. We have to accept that, we have to live within it. So anyway, on to what I was saying. 
I realised that when I was um, listening to this Rome cast that Neil Cramer was doing, a couple of the things that I thought to myself, well, yeah, actually, no, I disagree with that. You, know, you can think what you want, Neil, but I don't agree with you on this. Whereas before, when I, you know, back in the day, I just listened to his videos and I'd accept everything that he said. And I realised actually being confident enough to disagree, being confident enough to stand and say, well, actually, no, I disagree, but I'm willing to listen to your, your stuff because, you know, you're mostly inspiring. There might be a couple of things that I think, you know, no, you're wrong there, but, but you're mostly inspiring. So I'm carry on listening. Now, that is a good balance. It also is, it shows that on one hand, I'm thinking, yeah, all right, I like, I like the fact that there's other people out there that are, that are, what can I say, inspiring me and making me feel more enlightened in a lot of ways. But at the same time, I also like the fact that about where I am right now in my life, I'm confident enough to say, I don't agree with that, uh, but it's all right. And that's where I am right now. And that's where a lot of people have to get. When people get to that point, right, we'll be able to live in the new paradigm. The new paradigm basically is, um, we are in a world where there are no grand narratives anymore. We're in a world where it's even very difficult to know if there is an objective truth anymore because, because we're in a world that's very fragmented and very broken up. It's hard to get any, for us to find anyone who is a good authority on anything anymore. And um, I'm <laughs> bewildered by this. I mean, completely bewildered by it. But at the same time, I'm also thinking to myself, well, I'm left on my own to model this my own way, whatever the hell I do. And if that's the case, I've got to be confident in my opinions and I've got to be confident in my thoughts, irrespective of whether or not other people would um, judge me harshly for um, thinking that way, the way I do. So, the Lurgy, right? They take Linda away from Colin and David disease. I'm trying not to set the algorithms off here, right? Neil Kramer said in a previous podcast that I listened to him that he believes it to be a hoax. Now, i be honest, right? I'm not going to judge anyone for coming to these conclusions, but I, I don't. And the reason why I don't believe it to be a hoax is because I have a few people, or I know a few people, who claim to have had it, right? And they have been very consistent and very specific in the symptoms that they've had. Now, there's this uh, doctor... Um, on YouTube. I think his name is Dr. John Campbell, an English uh, doctor who decided to come out and start making videos and um, talking as much in depth about, um, about it as possible and reporting as a freelance reporter just, just, just basically because he wanted to help in whatever way he, he did. And I kind of felt that he, his contribution to all of this from the very outset was quite agenda free. Seemed like a nice man, right? And he said, um, what uh, the respiratory uh, symptoms would be that would kill you. I don't know how to describe it very specifically or succinctly, but just to say that um, you drown in your lungs. Your lungs can no longer um, actually deliver oxygen to you because they're full up with mucus and basically you drown inside your lungs, right? That's basically what uh, happened to Gareth Davis. Um, exactly what happened, you know, right to him. He drowned in his lungs and, uh, you know, and of course, the other people that I know who um, got it but didn't die, like my mate who lives in West London, um, who I referred to in the last uh, episode as being somewhere in the middle of the somewhere and anywhere thing, but kind of inhabiting the, uh, the bits of it that I'm not, but equally being as anomalous, him, he got it, right? Um, another mate of mine, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, another mate of mine, what's his name? I don't want to mention him by name, but he'll know that I'm referring to him if I refer to him as Space Monkey, right? He got it, and um, a few YouTubers and a few celebrities and talking heads also got it, and I just decided to follow them to see what they said. They all said they got the same symptoms. They all described exactly the same symptoms. They are symptoms that I've never heard of existing before, um, including, you know, fatigue, uh, was it like lethargy, like the symptoms of ME, basically, sleeping two extra hours a day, feeling like they have no energy, losing their sense of taste, losing their sense of smell, and um, having a kind of what feels like a very prolonged thing that goes on for much longer than anything that you would normally get any illness for, but at the same time it being quite cold and flu-like in a lot of ways. 
So this is something that seems to be a new phenomenon. And so as a result, I don't think of it as a hoax. I think it's a real disease. How it got out there, that's another thing. Um, it, I think it basically China were very negligent and they let something escape from their labs. Now, I don't think they'd be stupid enough to declare chemical warfare on, or biological warfare on the world um, at this point. But at the same time, I think, I think they, they nevertheless uh, thought, well, it's out of the lab now. Let's seize the opportunity to see if we can do a few things. They knew that with their totalitarian system that they can enforce total lockdowns, right? And in the process of doing so, they could probably open back up. They knew that the West, because the West respects freedoms of people, would, would not know what to do. And they let a few of their people go around the world and be super spreaders right so i do believe that it's a real illness i reckon that it was um it's part of a cock up rather than part of a conspiracy i think that it was let out um uh, once they knew that there was something out they downplayed it but they allowed people to travel to the world but not within china right um i think that they used it uh basically to create economic warfare so that china's economy could carry on growing and they thought that maybe they could collapse the Western economies in the world or slow down the rest of the world and um, go off on a bit of a power grab themselves. I don't think it's working out too well for them at the moment, though. That's, that's one thing for sure. They don't seem to have many friends or allies left at the moment. And their reputation is going downhill, especially Xi Jinping, Winnie the Pooh. So, yeah, this is what, what I think is going on. I think they've done a very bad job of it. I think also, as well as that, that our governments are doing a very bad job of everything that they're doing. I think that they're bumbling, negligent idiots, mostly. I think it's more cock-up than conspiracy what's going on in the world. I think, obviously, there's a bit of both that's going on right now. But I think that the real issue that we're dealing with right now is not whether it's a hoax or not, not whether it's real or not, not whether the vaccine is real or not. I mean, personally, I don't, um, you know, I've taken it. So, you know, and I'm, I'm, I feel the same as I've always felt. Now, I don't know if this will last. I, as I say, I'm being a case study here on YouTube. So if anything happens to me or my health or any complications that are delayed or deferred kick in, then, of course, I will report honestly on it on this channel. That's for sure. I'm quite happy to do that. I'm quite happy to be a stuntman. And I'm quite happy to be a case study. Stupid but brave? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I can only hope that nothing happens. And, you know, maybe, maybe I'll be all right. So, uh, at least I will be, you know, how can I say, in the firing line, being able to report on what's going on through, through experience. Right. But nevertheless, I've come to the conclusion that I don't think that a vaccine is a problem at all. But... I do think that the, what it is going to be used for, you see, the governments in the Western world, as they want to take our freedoms away from us, and as some globalists might think, oh, we want to bring in a total surveillance control matrix, uh, but we can't do anything unless we scare and nudge and manipulate and then um, you know, get people to give us consent to take their freedoms away. I think that the vaccine is being used as a means of being able to bring in a digital passport, a digital fingerprint, QR code thing, so that they can build a digital prison around us all. Yeah, I think that that is the only thing malevolent related to the vaccine itself. I don't think there's anything else than that. Might be wrong, but that's as far as I can see. And I think that there will be pushback against it, um, because I think a lot of people will say, no, we're not standing for this. We are, after all, in an age of awareness, right? But the trouble is, while this is all going on, and I'm sorry, this is a very long-winded video as I'm trying to get around to my point here, but as all of this is going on, the grand narratives, that is, the, um, whether it be the church, whether it be Christianity, that was a kind of a, acted as a form of moral fabric or moral cohesion to Western countries before um, we went into a more kind of fragmented secular world that we're in at the moment, has gone. So the, the concepts of absolute good and bad seem to have gone um, uh, in that kind of way. Whether, of course, or not, you know, it's a mainstream that was small, or mainstream media that was small, um, that the, uh, say, the mainstream and the alternative shared the same platforms, i.e. Um, TV, films, um, a top 20 or top 40 of music charts and stuff like this, something that was containable, something that would, um, that would glue the whole entire culture together, shall we say, yeah? Has now given way to this narrow cast of fragmented internet stuff 
where you know we are how can I say where we're all micro celebrities and anyone outside our echo chamber don't know who the fuck we are that sort of thing right there can be people with nine nine hundred uh, yeah, no, there can be people with 100,000 followers on YouTube, yet no one's heard of them. There can be someone else with a half a million followers, no one's heard of them either. That sort of thing. And then uh, there can be people who are known, like, uh, and quite famous, because they, they go from the mainstream media, the television world, the radio world, and they go back to um, uh, mainstream media, and they are quite known. So you've got people like, obviously, Jordan Peterson. But you have to be quite notorious and infamous in the eyes of the woke these days, right, you know. But anyway... Yes, yeah, so you've got that. The, the legacy media, TV channels and all of that, they are, uh, of course, people are still famous on these platforms. But then if you don't watch television and you're into the mainstream media, you equally won't know who half the people are, you see? So that's the thing. We are in a world now where the world of fame and the world of media has become fragmented. As a result of it all becoming fragmented and there's all these different echo chambers, it kind of means that uh, there isn't anything that is universally cohesive. Um, there isn't a kind of common reference point for us all to talk about a lot of things. And there doesn't seem to be a cohesive uh, morality fabric uh, within the matrix of our reality that we are in at the moment either. Now, that's all gone as well. So we're in this sort of situation now where we have no choice but to stand alone and work this shit out for ourselves. We have to be comfortable with uncertainty. We have to be uncomfortable. We have to be comfortable in a world with an absence of grand narratives, and we have no choice at this point to try and do that thing that Nietzsche suggested we try to do, which Jordan Peterson is sceptical that we can do. We should try to pull our socks up. We should basically try to get an idea of what good and evil is from the moral standpoint, from the most objective way that we can understand it. And we should try to be decent to each other. I don't know if we can do it. But, you know, there will be people out there that say, oh, this can't be done. My attitude is, nothing can't be done. Someone once said to me, how do you spell can't? T-R-Y. That's how they said That's what they said. So we have to try. And we can try and fail. And then say, all right, we tried and it didn't work. And then we can try again. Or alternatively, we decide that, no, we can't live in this fragmented world we have to be able to try and build uh, a new grand narrative that is all-encompassing, that is cohesive, that pulls us all together. But if we can do that without um, succumbing to collectivism in the form of communism or fascism, right, then that, again, would be good. If, if the individual could still be um, something that is honoured above the group, you know, that if we could still do that, that would be something that would be very important. So, yeah, I will say... Um, before I go to uh, Neil Kramer that I don't um, agree with you about whether of course the Colin and David without Linda disease is a hoax or not I don't agree that, uh, with you that it's a hoax I think it's real but I come to this conclusion through my own discernment and through my own thinking and through my own trying and testing I didn't just follow the herd to come to this conclusion my my conclusion is that I can't just blindly live in a world where I think that the mainstream is all lies and the alternative is all truth. Not when I see how culty everything appears to be becoming. And that's another thing about us going into this world of fragmented narrow casts with no grand narrative. What's happening is, right, that everyone is just appearing to be like in little cults. And that's the trouble. We've got all these different cults everywhere. And I don't want to be a member of any of them. None of them at all. <laughs> you know? And that's what I say on my Facebook page. I put that on my Facebook page, and I say, not on your tribe, not on your, not on your echo chamber, not on your cult, not on your Nelly. Right? I'm trying to be an individual, but in the process of being an individual, I'm trying to be the most defined I've ever been as an individual. And I'm hoping, right, that that is something that a lot of other people are doing, because that's all we've got now. This is that new reality paradigm we should be able to feel free to disagree with each other and we should respect that we're all trying to work this out and we're all trying to map it right but we've got to think of ourselves as cartographers and right someone will miss that road or they'll miss that hill and we'll put all our maps together and realize that we didn't get anything wrong 
we didn't get it all right, we didn't get it all sort of universally the same as everyone else who cart uh, done the cartography to work out where we are. But it's not personal. We didn't do it to annoy the other cartographers. You see what I mean? And then we have to agree to some consensus as a result of that. But respect and, you know, common decency is where we need to be because again you know uh, if we're not if we're not coming from fixed ideological positions we're not being ideological zealots then we can be free to have different points of view and that's how it was before and that's a bit of that's a bit of the old world that i would like to preserve into the new world because that's the bit of the old world that is compatible with the new paradigm that is not being used in the new paradigm right and with that i shall leave you to it this has been quite a long video so, see you later, alligator. See you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, do your bit to help send big tech to the land of MySpace by having a look at the show notes below and checking out our alternative platforms.